Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my quest for historical knowledge here on the internet. Okay, today what we are going to watch is the video that won last week's Patrons Pick Poll. So once a week I put up a poll with uh, about three or so videos and the patrons select uh, which one is going to get on the channel for that week. And this is the one that had won out. Um, this is History of China by Sweeney. And um, I'm excited to check this out. I love uh, Chinese history. I feel like I'm always learning more and more and more every time I study. There's just so much out there um, to, to know, especially in Western culture. Um, it's, it's so easy to be brought up in a culture that focuses on Western history. And um, which is uh, kind of a shame for the fact that uh, Eastern history, and especially with, with China in this case, is incredibly fascinating. And um, you can always learn a lot. And every time I think you learn, you become more and more impressed um, with the history and with seeing how important it is. Um, and uh, there's just there's, there's always a lot of amazing things to learn. I, I, I never stop learning with this. All right. Um, so it looks like this is in multiple parts. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with part one today. If you would like to join in uh, with more polls in the future, I as with this video um, just a few minutes ago, I posted a new poll. You can go ahead and jump in. Um, a link to my uh, Patreon account will be down below. Um, uh, all tiers of pledge levels get to vote in the uh, poll starting at a uh, dollar a month. So it's a great way to support the channel, and I really, really appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The History of China, Part 1. This episode is made possible by Audible. Go to audible.com slash Sweeney or text Sweeney to 500 500 to get started with a free oh, audiobook cool. and a 30 day free trial. Nu Wa and Fu Shi, usually depicted as half human, half dragon spirit creatures, created humans out of clay as companions. The humans settled in the Yellow River and were ruled by the five good emperors, mythological figures who were peaceful and benevolent. But tragedy struck when the river flooded, devastating the land. You, uh, Yellow River, right? In um, China is one of the the four great river valley civilizations, with um, the Egyptians on the Nile, the Mesopotamian cultures on the Tigris Euphrates, the Indus Valley civilization on the Indus, and then um, China develops on the Yellow River. Um, and to kind of compare and contrast those. Um, the the Yellow River and the um, Tigris and Euphrates are prone to violent floods. That's why that's why you also see a lot of flood myths, um, great flood myths that come in those regions. Um, and then just to compare to contrast it, um, the Indus and uh, Nile rivers actually have far more predictable flooding. Um, so you don't see those as much in those uh, areas. And they saw the flooding in their cultures as basically a blessing right because it was predictable it was a little bit more gentle and they could use it and, and get ready for for uh um, get it ready for agriculture and things like that but then places like china or mesopotamia they're like cursing their gods pretty much um <laughs> when these floods happen because they again they can be so violent so i just thought i'd throw there uh, throw that in there in a um, ancient contrast compare and contrast there do the engineer spend 13 long years before flooded seconds. devastating the land you, oh, no. the engineer, spent 13 long years building canals and locks to control the waters, earning his place as the land's king. He founded the Sha Dynasty, China's first ruling family, and a structure of government that would remain unchanged for millennia. Um, we'll see. We'll see if uh, he gets to it. But um, there's a lot of people I know that have questioned if the Sha actually existed. And that these stories were um, kind of brought up later. Um, I just I, I thought it was interesting. I don't know if there really is a consensus on that because I have heard kind of story about them, but then also that they may not have existed. So where the sources are going to come from that. So interesting little thought there. All right, looks like he's got a cool little intro. Let's check it out again. Yeah. I'm so jealous these you know, these animators just you know a lot of stuff seems simplistic but I just I think it's great which is a skill I, I have right now so I'll leave it to the experts though cool in the words of John Green an open letter to the Shah dynasty 
Dear Shah Dynasty, why you gotta be so fictional? Oh, okay. Yeah, the Shah Dynasty is largely considered mythological at this point, but may be intertwined with some real events, considering Usually how much the later Chinese scholars wrote about them. Usually, a lot of myths, you know, a lot of myths don't just come out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Um, even like like Greek mythology, for example, like these these stories of gods and demigods and things like that. There's a lot of historians that that are not ruling out that peop those people existed. Maybe not as the deities they once were, but great kings or warriors or something like that. And then what happens is, especially before the history was being recorded, it um, gets passed down orally. And if especially if it's someone that did some kind of heroic deed or something what often happens through the generations is as the story get story gets told it gets conflated and then it becomes a little bit more the, the story becomes a, a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger till it's almost like impossible or it can't be done by like a regular person you know what i mean that's so like like an achilles or something or even like zeus might have been like a great king and did these great deeds and then over time it's like it's like that game you play as a kid telephone Right? You ever played that where you start with a message and you whisper it to somebody and they whisper it and you keep going and then uh, the, the, the game at the end, the person says what it is that they had heard. And what always happens is the story is totally different or the phrase or whatever is totally different than when it started. Now, did that happen just because it can get a little bit harder and harder, you, you know, little words and stuff slowly over time start meaning something else to somebody intentionally change the story that's what we don't know but that's why he's saying yeah i mean a lot of this stuff might be intertwined with actual history um to the point where it's hard to even recognize you know when it comes out the other end speaking of writing the chinese were really really good at it they developed their own famous pictograph based system concurrently without any outside influence but they looked a lot more like this Very than cool. this mm -hmm. in any case humans settled in the yellow room yeah, they, um, Chinese writing. But they looked a lot more like this than this. Yeah, I'm glad he's saying that. Um, it probably started almost a more hieroglyphic in a way where it's like, yeah, it's picture writing. And then, you know, the, the difficult part about picture writing, and there's a reason why we don't really use it anymore, um, because... You have to, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do picture writing, basically means is is you have these characters represent something, right? And you can't, you you basically would have to have a different character for every possible thing you would want to write, right? Does that make sense? Because you don't want them to, to to possibly look the same. I mean, it can be similar, but you'd have to have to have that. It's not an efficient system. That's why um, most alphabets uh, eventually evolve into. Um, or most writing systems end up evolving into uh, evolving to alphabets where it's based off of sounds. And basically what you do is you just need a character for basically every sound that can be made in a language. And then that could be consolidated. So you can combine them into something where a, a, a symbol doesn't necessarily have to mean a whole word, right? You can have an alphabet that represent a sound. So yeah, they think, you know, like, like Japanese, Chinese, some of these characters that started with that, what they end up not maybe necessarily, uh, becoming like a, like a real full alphabet but what they do is become um easier to make too and try to limit how many strokes and things like that you have to do now you can see with these they definitely become complicated but they can potentially represent a lot of different things um so they uh, of over time become more simplified less looking like specific objects or things and more just into a character so um a lot of writing out here in the east that's kind of how it developed and again, why it looks so different than, um, say, Western writing. In any case, humans settled in the Yellow River Valley, forming numerous cultures which is collectively called the Yellow River Civilization. The myth of you the engineer likely began with this early civilization's attempts to control the flooding of the river. Yeah. These settlers are what we now call the Han, although they didn't refer to themselves as that for at least a few centuries. There was Yeah, there's the famous Han Dynasty, which kind of brings it out ancient classical golden age but i'm um, going back to the whole idea of the geography there and i, I hope they've already kind of um got you to understand a little bit about how also how um they view these natural occurring events like flooding and can often tie it to like deity worship right so like in egypt for example the 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 floods they believe were caused by is a supernatural thing, right? That's how they how they explain it. Um, and since the floodings, the floods were a good thing, they kind of attribute that to maybe a better nature of the gods. The gods are kinder and that sort of thing. And it's why, like for example, in Egypt, they view the afterlife 
Um, and, and a lot of what the, and their relationship with the gods is far more friendly and favorable and something you want to be as opposed to like Mesopotamian religion, where since you had these natural disasters and they were really bad, like the flooding member of the Mesopotamia is bad, they saw the gods as capricious and jealous and they're always like cursing people and all that. So their religion, the, like in, in Mesopotamian culture, like in Samaria, for example, the afterlife was seen as like a scary, dark, grim place. And you're seeing how you can tie geography to that. And think of how much work you would have to in like Mesopotamia or in uh, um, the Yellow River because it's still the best river you know out in that region. Um, how much work you'd have to put into it uh, to to be able to maintain it because those floods you got to be ready for them. They're going to come. You may, may not be able to predict them, but you better be able to harness them and make them hopefully a little bit less destructive if you can. Surrounded by numerous other peoples to their south, north, and west, the first Chinese state to be supported by historical evidence is the Shang. The story goes that the Shang were one of the member states of it the Sha dynasty existed. and rose up to overthrow the last Sha emperor under their leader, King Tang. Tang defeated the forces of the Sha during a storm at the Battle of Mingtao. The storm was seen as a sign that the spirits were blessing his overthrow of the dynasty. In 1046 BC, the Shang were overthrown by the Zhao, which is China's longest lasting dynasty. It is speculated that the name for China in the Mandarin language comes from this period. The Zhao ruled the kingdom under a quasi-feudal system, meaning that power was given to regional warlords, all of whom pledged fealty to the king. It's This is a, a very common thing, especially in the ancient world, of how you can govern something very, very large is... Um, basically feudally like it's hard to have a centralized government where one specific government can rule over a massive nation so what you get is more indirect rulership whether it's with lords or um, governors or things like that and you see that again very common um, however you're going to see in china too it become more centralized a centralized bureaucracy which really became a model for a lot of other states one other thing i wanted to add about chinese geography is you know, if you look at a map of the major civilizations of the early ancient period, right, like the four river valley civilizations, China is so far removed from them that there's not nearly as much interaction. OK, so like, for example, you got clear over here in the east and China is protected by a bunch of borders that separates borders and dis natural borders and distance from the other major civilizations. So like in China's case here, you have the Gobi Desert up north, and then you have the Himalayas, the largest mountain range in the world to its south. It was very, very cut off from a lot of that. That also developed Chinese un China's uniqueness from the other major civilizations of the world, as opposed to like Mesopotamia, for example, which is at the crossroads of a bunch of different civilizations. So they were very well connected and they changed a lot. China is going to be one of the least changing of the ancient civilizations. A lot of that due to that proximity. And when you do have larger civilizations like the Zhou or the Shang before them, um, you almost get this, uh, this idea that they kind of believe that, that they're kind of the only real civilization out in the world and since they are far more advanced than maybe some of the fringe ones there's kind of this um this yeah this complex of uh, of like cultural superiority which comes again from kind of that distance because the people they do interact with um to them might seem less maybe even in the chinese eyes as civilized in a way and they're going to be far more advanced than these other fringe societies which gave them a uniqueness and uh, a pride i think in that uniqueness that you're going to see throughout chinese history forever and of course even today. This means that the king's power depends on keeping the lords happy, which King Yu did not. He exiled his yeah, wife whom he had married for political reasons and the state she came from rose up in revolt. They deposed the king oh, and no. installed his son Ping to the throne but merely as a figurehead with no real authority as regional warlords began crowning themselves kings over their own states. Chroniclers refer to this time as the period of spring and autumn. It doesn't translate well into English. Soon a rivalry would emerge among these states for control of all China begin. This is, uh, I'll go back a few seconds. This is what happens with feudalism. Um, feudalism is where your loyalty is more tied to a local ruler that can protect and can kind of help you or whatever, give you uh, military protection, give you land, give you that sort of thing. Your loyalty is more tied to a local um, lord, powerful person, than to a centralized government potentially far away. And this usually happens again when you don't have a central government that can rule over huge 
um, territories, which again is, is again very common. And the problem with with feudalism way, or if you are even are an attempting a centralized bureaucracy, if you have power spread out to different individuals across the land, there's always going to be that threat of revolt, right? Because these warlords are the ones, or, or just lords in general, um, they have a lot of power because they have the loyalty of the people there because they, they help them survive. They give them food, they give them protection, they give them a life, and their loyalty is going to be to them. So let's say you're one of these lords in one of these different regions, provinces, whatever you want to call it. Um, if they have issues with maybe the lord, or sorry, the, the, the king or emperor above them, they have the ability to raise armies and have loyalty. And if you see, if you see that the potentially that the position of emperor could be one that would, a lot of people might want, you may get a lot of people competing. And then the Warring States period, as it's coming out here, um, you definitely have that. So you have kind of China is breaking up. It's kind of who wants to do it, and and they're going to talk about this more. But this is a common story with uh, a feudal society. Beginning the Warring States period, and a collapse of any centralized control. Warring became so fierce, in fact, that the local kings began building compacted earth fortifications on their mutual borders to deter invasions from rival states. Walls in China? What? Fighting ended in 221 BC when the Qin finally defeated the rest and unified China once more. The Qin Dynasty didn't last very long, but they did have absolute authority. This is a, this is important too with the Qin Dynasty because they're kind of the first Chinese or emperor of, of China. Um, Shi Huangdi, the the emperor of China, is basically the first person to unite basically what you would consider all of China. Why he's off, why he's usually considered the first emperor of China. So, ending the Warring States period and basically these centuries of warfare was an incredible feat, as nobody had ever done this before, um, and. China often gets it said it gets its 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 name actually more directly from the Qin, you know, Qin uh, in a way, and uh, Shuangdi is a huge part of that. So we'll we'll let them uh, we'll let uh, Sweeney here continue with this though. Agriculture and herding were regulated, and everyone paid their taxes. Far more central. They did have a weird fear of books for some reason. Well, the teachings of Confucius yeah. became very popular. Okay, so yeah, the um. There's a, a, a philosophy also, competing philosophy is also developing here, legalism and Taoism. Um, legalism, basically the standpoint that people are naturally aren't going to do the right thing. So you need a powerful ruler to basically enforce rules and that uh, rule breakers should be met pretty, pretty harshly. That's how you keep order. Otherwise, society is going to collapse. Where Taoism actually sees over governance as, as um, more unnatural and things like that. So... He would definitely be on like the legal side of things. So if you, uh, Shi Wangdi was um, against a lot of the philosophy that might come into question about his authority and the maybe the the, the authority over uh, or, or um, his idea that that governance and and, and strict government, strict uh, punishments for har uh, harsh law breaking was a, a key element. So basically, he was known for burning books of philosophy, um, especially because many of them might be against kind of his style of rule and maybe his legitimacy. So he was known as, yeah, a uh, book burner that burned a lot of those different uh, uh, competing, anything that might be competing against him there. But like you said, the, the Qin Dynasty isn't going to last very long, um, but it definitely did put China in a, a motion and put a lot of standards that China will be built upon. And his brand of philosophy began having huge impacts on Chinese society. In response to the growing power of the Zhang Nu, the ancestors of the Mongols, Emperor Qin Shi Huang began joining parts of the Warring States walls at strategic weak points in the border. This would be the first foundations of China's Great Wall. Sure. The walls continued to be expanded upon using hundreds and thousands of slave laborers and soldiers over... Contrary to popular belief, the Huns never attacked China. Westerners mistakenly confused the Zhang Nu with the Huns, who had also originated from Central Asia. Yeah, um, the Huns will definitely invade west towards Europe and set off a domino effect leading to Germanic tribes um, invading into Rome. But yeah, so yeah, what he did, the Great Wall of China was a linking of multiple walls, like, he, like he's saying here, multiple walls kind of putting those things together. Um, and although we kind of know, you know, a lot of people know that the, the walls never completely protected China. I mean, people will find their way over, or through, or, you know, all kinds of different ways. So, you know, that's why a lot of people say maybe the uh, Great Wall of China's greater purpose may have been more for 
a sign of authority in a way. Like if you're outside the walls, you see this, you're like, man, this is a great and powerful empire and more specifically a great and powerful, maybe emperor or walls remember also serve the purpose of keeping people in. Um, one thing we know about the, the joining of these walls and kind of the fortifications with under Shiwang Di was how brutal it was. Um, a huge percentage of China's peasant population was basically forced to work on the wall and, uh, basically uh, deathly um, conditions where a lot of people died of, uh, of exhaustion. And kind of an interesting thing is uh, that some people may not know is um, the dead were often buried with the wall. Um, there is, I don't know, I forget how many, like 100, 200,000 or something I thought I'd heard, uh, potentially dead bodies throughout the foundations of the wall. If you have a different number on that, then please, please continue. That was just one I, I kind of was thinking over the top of my head, but yeah, it's incredible giving it's also named by some as the long graveyard. So kind of creepy that way. Might be different next time or, or if you ever get to visit the, the Great Wall of China. Successive centuries to protect hundreds and thousands of slave laborers and soldiers over successive centuries to protect the empire from various other nomadic raiders. Qin Shi Huang became deranged and senile in his old age and became obsessed with finding a cure for death to allow him mortality. to attain immortality. He traveled far and wide and spent a small fortune on alchemy, medicines and potions, one of which killed him. Mercury. The succession of the emperor caused a crisis when the no they thought his chemists and him thought that mercury, the you know, uh, substance mercury could potentially hold the key to everlasting life. So he was basically taking mercury tablets, um, thinking they were going to give him long life. But what it actually did was they killed him. Um, it destroyed his brain. He became far more violent and just senile, basically. And it's kind of, it's, it's ironic. And, and kids always get a kick out of this when I'm teaching them is um, Shi Wang Di basically uh, died trying to become immortal, right? And often, uh, oftentimes we, we back in China to uh, close to Mesopotamia, where we talk about, um, Epic of Gilgamesh, which there's kind of a moral, that story too, which is similar, which is no matter how powerful you are. Okay. Powerful, famous, rich, um, no one can cheat death. No one can cheat death. Shuang Di learned that. Nobles attempted to crown his son and control him as a puppet, causing the country to erupt into a civil war between rival I don't states. I think a lot of people mourned when the he Han died. state was victorious, which began the rule of the Han dynasty, famous for inventing paper, which is apparently what people used to write things on. Apparently, <laughs> a lot of people say Han. So the Han pick up in a way because the the it it kind of gets chaotic after the Qin die, then the Han come in and really set a classical standard. A lot of people say this is the beginning of like the classical golden age. And this is when you really start to see major, major foundations for the China of the future and present as with the Han. During the unification war, the rulers of the Yu state fled to the south in exile, where they set up their own kingdoms, the Nan Yu and the Min Yu, stretching all the way to modern Vietnam. The Han began a period of aggressive foreign policy under Emperor Wu, conquering both the Yu kingdoms in the south and going to war with the Xiongnu Confederation in the north, annexing vast amounts of the ethnic no Turkic mass. Tarim Basin. This extremely rapid expansion into Central Asia gave China its first contacts with the numerous nomadic tribes of the Inner Steppes, attracting many merchants to the lucrative corridor between East and West. It was the beginning of the Silk Road. Then this becomes so important for China because, again, China is so more far technologically advanced than these people. And now that you have this, the intermediary between its Central Asia and then what's going to be like Persia and um, eventually Europe, this is creating that network. I mean, the Silk Road is going to be such a massive thing and we'll leave that to, to um, another topic. But one thing I think China figures out, too, is they have a lot of products that are exclusive to them and superior to other products, and the rest of the world wants it. And China's going to take the Silk Road very, very seriously because it's going to make them a fortune with the stuff that they make, especially, of course, silk, right? Which was maybe the most profitable of all of the exports coming out of China. It's also why they guarded the secret of silk making so, uh, so um, seriously for centuries. It was during the Han that China experienced its golden age. Great strides were made in developing art, culture, and science that would come to shape almost everything we know about Oriental culture today. A new religion making its way down the Silk Road Buddhism. began taking its own shape in the Southwest. It is known to us as Buddhism. Buddhism, yeah, it, it starts in India. Um, 
but interestingly, it doesn't get as popular in India, mostly because the, the foothold that was so strong with Hinduism, but traveled along with merchants into the into into China. Now, it also when Buddhism really became popular too was when when these dynasties would fall and there'd be a lot of chaos. Um, a lot of people kind of turned to Buddhism uh, because of its promising to end suffering and and some kind of hope for a next life, you know, that sort of thing where maybe a lot of the more traditional religions didn't have that kind of focus. So you see that tie in as China's hardest times for regular people. It's also the times when specifically Buddhism became the most popular. In the year nine, the Han Dynasty was briefly interrupted by a usurper named Wang Mang, who seized power from the Han in an attempt to establish his own dynasty. And he would have been successful were it not for his time. reforms to distribute land equally among the populace. He lost his territories in the west and was deposed by a mob after only 13 years of rule. I guess nobody told him it was way too early for China's communist revolution. <laughs> the Han eventually defeated the Xiongnu after generations of fighting and expanded their trade with the west. They eventually split into three rival kingdoms in 222 and briefly reunited under the Jin dynasty in 280. But the northern section rebelled against their rule by the so-called five barbarians, which the southerners called the sixteen kingdoms. Definitely get the the, uh, the 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 pattern here: unite, break, unite, break, right? Repeat for millennia. <laughs> but both the south and the north were unstable and changed ruling families too many times to name. The Sui came to power as successors to the Zhao state and unified China again in 589 while the Gokturks rose to power in the central steppes. Always, you know, the the Chinese have had an on-again, off-again relationship with these nomads. Um, what the nomads need are, are, are up here. So they don't, up, up in this kind of region of, of Northern Asia, North Central Asia, um, agriculture is very difficult. They don't have a lot of the major rivers and the climates and just agricultural uh, setting that you need. Um which required them oftentimes to do trade with sedentary societies like China. Like China has mass agriculture, so they could trade food with them. And a lot of times that was, it was, it was great. It was, it was fine. It was peaceful um, that they would do that. Now these nomadic peoples could offer animals because they're the ones that, you know, like raise horses or trade goods from other areas. So there was a mutual relationship there. Um, but especially too, if there were like famines or something like that, some kind of struggle by the nomadic tribes, that's when you saw them going much harder into China and it becomes more violent. Um, so the Chinese always had this interesting relationship of sometimes it's good and then sometimes it was terrible with whatever group is up here in the northern steppe. That's just part of the a big part of Chinese history too is that relationship, love-hate relationship with the northerners. The Tang succeeded the Sui and expanded the empire. They subjugated the Gok Turks in the north, conquered the Koreans in Goryeo, big and solidified their iron hold in Southwest Asia. So yeah, this is the most that China will conquer. They're expanding way further because classical China has always been between, um, kind of between the rivers here, right? And not as much into the steppe or definitely into, into Korea there. So you're seeing now a military expansion, but we always find with these kind of militarily expansionist um, states is they also became very, they become very expensive to maintain and, and not just main, or, or sorry, to, to, to maintain, but then also to hold the things that they conquered. That is always very difficult. And where China's also had issues with that is holding on to these places. Because it's one thing to conquer a place, but it's another place to keep hold of it. Tang China spread its influence over all the rest of Asia in China's second golden age. They were famous for introducing land reforms called the Fubing system, which is again a flirtatious experiment with communism. I can see where this is going. The reform um, rice is coming in from down south in Vietnam. That was the most important agricultural introduction to China, um, and it really expanded at this time. Um, rice farming, so it came from Southeast Asia, made its way up to China, which is great because a lot of China is mountainous, um, and you can farm rice. You can do like they they show in here um, the terraced farming, so you can terrace it out and manipulate your land to grow rice easily. Easily, and this also leads to a pop in, in this time. Uh, under the Tang, a massive Tang, and then the Song afterwards, a huge uh, population explosion. A lot of that due to the introduction of rice, which is a high calorie per acre um, crop and far more substantial. Reforms were, albeit successful, and the economic boom allowed for the budget of a standing army. If you're thinking to yourself that all this prosperity is too good to be true, 
then you'd be right. It was. In 906, China collapsed again due to the power of regional warlords. <laughs> the Song managed to control Cycling. the southern part of China, but the north remained ruled by Chinese-influenced nomads. The Jurchens, a fringe tribe in modern-day Manchuria, rebelled against their nomad rulers and soon conquered all the way down to northern China. They proclaimed the Jin Dynasty and vied for power with the Song in the south. But as both kingdoms contended with each other, a new powerful confederacy was brewing in the Mongolian steppes. Uh oh, Genghis. The Mongols were initially Kublai. a squabbling band of nomadic herdsmen. They had distant links to the Xiongnu of the past and made their home on the Eurasian steppe. Their culture was deeply steeped in tradition and a religion that tied them to their land. Um, I think, well, actually, give me a second to see if he's going to explain. But this was all to change with one man named Timujin. Okay. Um, to Mongol religion. The Mongols, of course, have become famous for religious tolerance in their conquered empire. And a question often is why? Because a lot of empires don't do that. They want to impose their religion. And if you caught that, what he said is their religion is tied to their land. You have to be a part of their land, a part of their people for the religion to even apply to you. So like proselytizing is not a, a, an option. It's not even a thing that can be done in Mongol religion. So there was no need to spread their religion because you can't actually become their religion like that. So that was a big reason why um, you see religious tolerance for them because there's not really an option there. They have no ability or desire to impose a religion because it's incompatible with, with others there. Timujin, we know who he is, right? Or who he's going to become? The religion that tied them to their land. But this was all to change with one man named Timujin, who history remembers as Genghis Khan, a man who would he reform is. the Mongols from within and unite them into a powerful confederacy bound by blood and honor and create a legal framework like and exceptional social background. mobility. <laughs> The Mongols, under Genghis and his descendants, founded the largest land empire in history and would have impacts on nearly every part of Asia and even Europe. The story is told brilliantly in Jack Weatherford's Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Weatherford even narrated the book himself, which is available at today's sponsor, Audible. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks and other audio products, perfect for long walks, exercising, commuting to work, or plane journeys and airport layovers, my personal preference. Bolton, for history fans, <laughs> this is one of the best ways to learn about something new you've always wondered about or build on those gaps from your favorite topics and time periods. Somebody Just head to Audible on any device, somebody. download your book, and start listening. It's that easy. Or listen to Audible is offering a free 30-day trial where you can get Weatherford's book or anything else at no charge with seamless sync between your Amazon Kindle or Kindle app. By simply heading to audible.com slash Sweeney or texting S-U-I-B-H-N-E to 500-500, which will also support the creation of more episodes. Thank you to Audible support for supporting the channel. This is where we leave China today. Tune in next time for the next chapter, one that would bring both the Song and the Jin to their knees when we cover the Mongols. Yes. And subscribe to never miss out on a new video. If you like this series and want to help it grow, please consider supporting at Patreon. There are great rewards such as HD artwork from the videos, early previews and merchandise. Become a patron today using the link in the description. And please support them. Um, if you are only able to sub or, or, or uh, um, pledge to one channel on Patreon, make it, make it theirs. Um, they're the original content creators. Um, they do such an amazing job. I, I, I'll try to add things and give a perspective if I can, but they're they're the true, the true goats out there, right? <laughs> All right. Well, I love this. Uh, it's a great kind of just summarized thing. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how you do, right? How do you do Chinese history justice? Uh, I mean, just this part in, in in ten minutes, but it's great, entertaining. Love what Sweeney's doing here. Um, awesome. Definitely looking forward to part two. So hopefully, I was able to add a few other things. I just I love learning about China. I love talking about China. I'm always learning new impressive things and, and stories and, and lessons and all that. And we're about to begin what I think one of the most interesting parts of Chinese history, which is the Mongol occupation, which is going to um, definitely change China, not for the present, but for the future. And we'll, I'll wait, we'll wait to uh, part two to, to go ahead and get into that. So I really enjoyed this. I hope you do too. Please, um, in the description, we'll have a link to the original video. Make sure you head over there and subscribe to Sweeney. Give them a like. Give them, give them a 
thumbs up, give them a, a shout out so that we can make sure that content creators get their, um, um, get their due, get their credit. Cause we need, we can never have enough of them and can never not show enough support with that. All right. Just, to, um, on the way out here, this video was chosen by, uh, patron pledgers for my channel here. So if you'd like to get involved in that and be able to vote on weekly polls and just to support the channel that way, um, link is down below and you can, uh, do that and be part of, again, our, our polls there. A couple other just plugs. If you have not joined our discord community, make sure you do that. There's a link to that down below with a bunch of great history, uh, uh, minded fans we could talk uh, we talk about every possible about history topic out there so come on in join us it's a great way to communicate with other people and maybe interact with me a little bit more all right and with that i think we'll go ahead and end it look out for uh, a part two video i definitely want to look into that but until then we'll see you next time bye